And then Heather, it's all you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Shirley. Um, my name is Heather Goodenkoff. I am um, an Iowa girl and I um, have lived the past 26 years in Dubuque, um, but we recently moved to be closer to my children, our three children and my parents. So we live um, on the edge of Cedar Rapids now, but um, Dubuque will always be, be home to us as well. Um, I'm the author of eight novels. Um, my most recent one, This Is How I Lied, came out last year around this time. And my newest novel, um, called The Overnight Guest will come out next winter. So I'm excited to uh, share that with you. But the reason I'm here tonight is to talk about libraries and librarians and readers. It's National Library Week. And it is such an important service that our libraries provide for us. So when Shirley asked if I would speak um, about this, I was, was very excited to do so because libraries really are um, some of my favorite places to visit. It doesn't matter if it's a, um, you know, a small town library, a big town library, big city, um, you know, classroom libraries even, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Um, because seeing books lined up and um, the services that libraries provide have just, it's always been very important to me. And I'll talk more about that as we move along here. And today, so we're celebrating libraries and how historically libraries have been really a calm in the storm um, during difficult times. Um, and, you know, goodness knows we sure have had a lot of those lately, um, some challenging times, but we're, you know, we're finding that libraries are there for us, librarians are there for us, sometimes in the most surprising ways. Uh, and I'll talk about how libraries have influenced um, some of my colleagues who are writers and also readers that I've come into contact over uh, with over the years. Um, they're, I'm going to share their words as well. And I'll talk a little bit about how libraries um, actually helped me during a particularly bumpy um, point in my childhood and really put me on the path to becoming a reader and a writer. Um, so you know, first of all, libraries really are a calm in the storm. And, you know, people don't realize the services that they, they often provide. Um, you know, back to September 11th, they, um, you know, that libraries played a big part in um, providing, getting information out to people and um, being, um, you know, a safe haven for people and hurricanes and earthquakes and flooding. Um, and fire and um, extreme weather situations. Um, you know, when I think about um, the derecho, um, you know, this last summer um, and how devastating that was and the cleanup that libraries were there were there for their patrons. Um, but many people do, don't know that libraries were incredibly important during World War I, especially. Um, um, there's a picture there of the American Library Association volunteers in Paris in 1919. And um, between 1917 and 1920, the Library War Service established three dozen camp libraries uh, for people during the war. And they had special uniforms created for the librarians. And the American Library in Paris uh, was established in 1920 and it continues to this day, um, so very important. Um, and we talked a little bit about the, uh, the natural disasters and, and the way that, um, uh, you know, their heating and cooling centers for extreme weather. And um, one thing I learned while I was doing a little more research was that um, even like in Ferguson, Missouri, where um, there were riots there and um, there was a shooting of an un unarmed black teen, um, the, the havoc that really created um, for that whole entire community and schools were delayed. Many, um, many days of school were missed because schools were closed and, and students got behind. And uh, the, the library there um, offered lunch. Um, they, they even hosted informal classes uh, for students during that difficult time. So libraries, you know, provide us with books and, um, you know, listening material and movies, of course, but we all know that there's um, dozens and hundreds of other programs that they provide. 
isn't this true? Rita Mae Brown, one of my favorite authors says, when I got my library card, that's when my life began. And I think that's true for many of us. Uh, many of you might not know this though, that before Ben Franklin became, um, flew that famous kite and discovered electricity, did you know that he was a librarian? Well, sort of. He and his philosophy group called Junto organized the Articles of Agreement, which set up the nation's very first library called the Library Company. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about me a little bit. Um, there you can see me. Um, I'm front and center with my wonderful brothers and sisters. I, I was born in South Dakota, the youngest of six. And I grew up um, hearing about these wonderful stories that um, my family experienced while we lived on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota, where my dad was a school counselor and my mom was a school nurse. And um, it really brought a sense of community and that, that sense of storytelling. Um, well, one special thing that we brought back with us um, from South Dakota, from the reservation and my father's students was a toy box and, that my father's students made for our family. And we brought that with us to Mason City, Iowa. Now Mason City, if you're familiar with that, is the, the real town, um, based on the fictional town of River City, Iowa um, in The Music Man. So when I was three, we moved to Mason City. And of course, Meredith Wilson's The Music Man was set there. Um, if you're not familiar with the musical, it's the story of this ne'er-to-do um, salesman who tries to sell the townspeople um, non-existent musical instruments. Um, but also integral to the story is a footbridge, a library, a librarian by the name of Marion. And some people don't know that there really is a footbridge that leads to that library. And there's a picture of that footbridge. And here's a picture of the children's room. Now, I spent so much time, more hours than I can count um, at this library, um, just perusing through the shelves. Um, it, you know, many Saturday and Sunday afternoons, my, my dad would drop me off at the library and I would just be in heaven walking around the stacks. Um, but also one of the elementary schools that I attended was just a few blocks from this public library. And once a month, our classroom teacher would hand out our library cards and we would walk across, you know, this footbridge, um, clutching our library um, cards. And we would go to the library where this wonderful librarian was there waiting for us. She would bring us into the children's story room and she would read a story to us. And then when she was done with the story, she'd release us into the stacks to find books that were just right for us. Um, one thing I always took umbrage with, there was always a rule as to the number of books we could check out. And I, I, I am stuck on the number three for some reason, that sounds about right. And I always wanted to, um, to check out more books, obviously. Um, and I'm gonna come back to my story in just a few minutes, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, I reached out to several readers and fellow writers who enthusiastically shared with me what libraries and librarians mean to mean to them. So this is Lisa Unger, one of my writing pals. Um, she is an amazing thriller writer, a New York Times bestselling author. And, you know, she told me this story. I was asking um, some of my writing pals, you know, what do libraries mean to you? Um, and she, this, these are her words. She says, my father was an engineer who told me that writer was not a job description. Luckily, my mother, a librarian at the Chester Library in Chester, New Jersey, knew I was a writer at heart. And it was from her that I learned my love of books and story, though she'd hoped I'd find a real job. I'm glad Lisa didn't find a, a real job because her books are amazing. And Lisa says, I remember going to work with her during her evening shift and doing my homework in the stacks, feeling totally at home. She says, 
She says libraries are a safe haven for stories and for readers, a place where it's always okay to be quietly immersed in an alternate reality. They are a cornerstone of our communities and our industry. I agree. Okay, here's another librarian. This is St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence, one of the patron saints of libraries, was a Catholic deacon who was executed in the year 258 for trying to protect the collection of treasures and documents that were in his care. So librarians, as we know, um, go uh, great lengths to uh, protect books and freedom of speech and um, very important to, to our society. Libraries, many of you may or may not know, also can be a home for the homeless. I love this story. This is an amazing story. I heard about it quite by accident, even though it features um, Dubuque's library, the Carnegie Stout Library, and a, a, a small town um, library right on the, the, the border of Iowa and um, Wisconsin. Uh, in Platteville, I heard this story on This American Life, which is this great podcast uh, that tells true life stories. And this story was about a young girl um, who was homeless in the Dubuque area. Uh, we do have homelessness in Iowa, and it's quite prevalent. And um, when I was a classroom teacher, we had learned that you know the average age of a homeless person is actually 10 years old um, to be, and that, that struck me as just being incredibly um, devastating, just terrible. Um, so there are many complex issues around homelessness and libraries and librarians encounter this more than most. Libraries are often a respite uh, and an imperative connection um, for communities and for those facing homelessness. So this is Lydia Sigworth. She's a librarian from Platteville, Wisconsin, and she knows all about this. There was a time when Lydia spent a lot of her time at the Carnegie Stout Public Library in Dubuque, all day, almost every day, for six months straight. And on This American Life, this, this uh, podcast, and I hope you go and look for it, um, she talks about how the librarian there, Mrs. S, she called her, um, was the epitome of kindness and generosity, constantly giving her attention and time to make um, her family feel welcome during a very difficult time. She was such a positive influence in Lydia's life that Lydia grew up to be a children's librarian 20 odd years later. So amazing. So Lydia Sigworth says, um, this just isn't me. It just isn't Carnegie. It just isn't Platteville. This is what libraries do. Another story um, that a reader reached out to me and shared about her experience with homelessness in libraries. This is from Cynthia D. She's from Florida. She says, I was sleeping in the library, a homeless college student. The librarian there befriended me. A year later, I found myself um, she found out my story and six months after that, she became my roommate. And she says, now I'm living in a safe place where I'll be able to finish my BSN. Librarians are amazing. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Now, this might be a familiar face to you. This is Mary Potter Kenyon, an acclaimed author and proud Iowan. Um, she also shared with me her experiences with libraries. And uh, she says, I grew up with the Ruth Succo Memorial Library in Earlville. She said, my family was poor and many of us were bullied, including me in elementary school. The library was where I found my friend's book. I was determined I would read every book in the library. My two younger sisters and I would pick up our five or six books on a Friday. And by Sunday, we'd be trading them with each other. The librarian, Joan Laxon, made a huge difference in my life. She treated me like I mattered, helping me to choose books, not charging me money when I uh, dropped a book in the sink, um, 
Mary says she did dishes. She uh, propped the book up on the windowsill while she did dishes so she could read. Um, she even worked there during the summer as a teen and uh, the librarian gave her many responsibilities and instilled in her a lot of confidence. She'd even leave Mary alone to run the library for a couple of hours when she was a teen, assuring her that she could handle it. She'd ask her opinion about books and Mary says she will forever treasure both that library and Joanne. So um, if you haven't read anything by um, Mary Potter Kenyon, I encourage you to check her out. Um, her newest book is called um, Call to be Creative. Libraries we know are sanctuaries for all, for everybody. And this is a story from Kathy Z, a reader, um, book lover from Wisconsin. She shared this with me. She says, my son has autism and is nonverbal. He cannot read or understand stories, but we always took him to the library starting when he was barely a toddler. The sweet librarians took the time to get to know him and to help us find books for him with pictures of the things he loved and obsessed over. They took the time to get to know a child who didn't respond well to them. I always remember this. He loved library and books. He still cannot talk or read at age 42, but he still loves his books. I love that story because yes, books that, you know, um, there's a book for everyone. And I truly believe that. And librarians are kind of that, that conduit to help us find the perfect books for us. Another famous librarian, this is Golda Meir. Before she became the fourth prime minister of Israel, Golda Meir worked as a librarian. A calm in the storm. So yeah, we talked a little bit about this. Um, and this is from a actually a bookstore owner from Cedar Rapids, Marion, uh, Marion area, um, Terry L. They, as she is a co-owner of Fox Swamp Books. So if you ever get down this way, over this way, um, check out Fox Swamp Books. But she also loves her library. And this is what she has to say about the Marion Public Library. She says they have been rock stars for our community um, during Derecho. They have jumped in and done countless things to keep library services and provide support for our community. Anyone in needing, um, and then another library, this is the Lab Library in Cedar Rapids, anyone who needed a co-working space while power was out for so many during Derecho, um, they, they could find space at the, the Lab Library um, during that, that crazy week when the storm had knocked out all the power and internet resources. Um, so in Grinnell then, it said in the immediate aftermath of the storms, emergency service personnel created charging stations for community members to charge their phones and computers at the public service building. And then as power returned to the libraries, its staff relieved firefighters and police officers at the charging stations by taking over some of those responsibilities. So great news with that. Now back to me a little bit. Okay, so when I last was talking about this, you know, we were Mason City, getting a chance to visit this beautiful library. Um, but I wasn't always the voracious reader that I am now. Um, I was really one of those kids who really struggled to learn how to read. I never knew what was going on. I was always the one asking my neighbor um, in the desk next to me, what are we supposed to be doing? Um, and I was always the last one to line up for gym or music class. Um, but thank goodness, thank goodness for our area education associations, they're hearing test mobile. So they came up, pulled up in front of the school one day and it was discovered, they tested my hearing. It was discovered that I had a profound hearing loss. I can hear, but I do, um, have a profound hearing loss that especially in school, it made it really difficult for me to know what was going on and to hear, um, especially in noisy classrooms. And so I got very far behind in class. I was one of those kids who needed speech um, support and I also needed reading support when I was little. But once I got hearing aids, um, I, I 
really accomplished so much more. The teachers made great accommodations for me. I got hearing aids and um, I was on the right track again. But with my kind of hearing loss, I, you know, I like to kind of describe it as when, when you have to work so hard to hear, it can be very, very exhausting. And I would come home from school so tired and I'd come home to my busy household with five older brothers and sisters, my, you know, my wonderful parents. And we had all kinds of animals. We had a, we had dog, we had cats, uh, we had gerbils and hamsters and gold or and finches and hermit crabs. Now we didn't always have these at the same time, um, but it was a very busy place. We even had a tarantula once and that's a whole nother story. Um, but I want to come home and just have quiet. And I would climb into that toy box with my books that I got from the library, their public library, close the lid, have my flashlight and a pillow inside, and I would look at my pictures. And that's really where my love for reading began. Okay, I started with many of the same books that... Um, I think a lot of you may have loved um, that, you know, Are You My Mother? The Story of Ferdinand was my absolute favorite. Back um, in the day, in the 70s, um, it was even before cassette tapes, we would have record players with stories on them. Now, you know, you can listen to it on, um, you know, digitally. Um, we had a record player that told the story of Ferdinand and I would sit there with that the book and listen to the record player uh, tell the story and I just, just loved it. And of course, The Little House by um, Virginia Lee Burton, which I still have that copy, uh, copy of that, which is very battered for, um, for the years of being well loved, but I, I do still have that. And of course, um, I would climb into the toy box with um, books by Beverly Cleary. And sadly, um, Beverly Cleary, Cleary died a few weeks ago. Um, but at the, the wonderful age of one, 104. So she was with us for a very long time. Um, but I was a huge fan of Ellen Tibbetts and Ramona and the Ramona books. Those two were probably two of my favorite. And you may not have known that Beverly Cleary was also uh, a librarian. So she grew up in a small town in Oregon where her mother asked the state library to send books to their farm. And during the depression, Beverly went and eventually became a children's librarian. She went to school and eventually became a children's librarian as well. So how fitting is that? Also into the toy box came the Laura Ingalls Wilder uh, series. I uh, would read those books in there as well. Uh, these were some of my favorite, uh, the Choose Your Own Adventure books, Journey Under the Sea, and there were just, I think there were hundreds of these books um, where you could choose different endings to your story, different paths. And of course, as I got a little bit older um, and was outgrowing the toy box, but, um, you know, still love to read, I, I latched on to Judy Bloom and her books. And as I got even older, um, The Thorn Birds by Colleen McCullough was one of um, you know, the biggest books I had read as a, a young person. And I remember my mom walked into the room and caught me reading it. And she was you know, properly scandalized and said, what are you doing reading that book? And I said, well, mom, it's the second time I've read it. Good book, not Shakespeare, but a great book nonetheless. And my all time favorite author, and writer um, and book, My Antonia by Willa Cather. Okay, another famous librarian. Okay, Casanova, from Lothario to librarian. Casanova was an infamous spy, writer, diplomat, and lover. Born in Venice during the first half of the 18th century, um, he studied to become a priest. But he was also well known for being a drinker and for having scandalous love affairs with numerous women. But later in life, he worked as a librarian in Bohemia. Libraries also heal broken hearts. And this is from a reader, um, Carrie from Connecticut. And this is her story. She says, I moved to a new town when I was 10, Vermont, 
or excuse me, Vernon, Connecticut. I was so sad to leave behind my schools, my friends, and the Vernon Public Library was almost in my backyard. We had to walk through a property that had burned down 150 years before. It was overgrown, the stairwell was still there, and it was filled with wildflowers. My mom walked with me the first few times, but when I met the librarian, Mrs. Foley, she happened to live a couple houses away. She introduced me to my very first new friend. Her name was Georgette. Mrs. Foley not only opened up my eyes to the amazing world of reading, but also healed a little girl's broken heart. Georgette and I are still friends to this day, thanks to Mrs. Foley. And from the heart. Another writing pal of mine, Pam Jenna, uh, New York Times bestselling author of 11 novels, including The Lost Girls of Paris. And she has a new one, um, The Girl with the Blue Star, coming out uh, very soon. Um, here's her story. So she lives in Philadelphia, Pam does. And she says, my story is that I use five library systems and pre-COVID, I was often at all of them before noon on a Monday. So as soon as I can get back to all of them, I will metaphorically kiss the floor. And I know this, Pam is a huge fan of libraries and a great supporter of um, literacy. And uh, be sure to check her out as well. Libraries are life-changing. This is from Laura Lee from Boston. Mrs. Twitchell was the children's librarian when I was little. My mom would take me there for story time and I was hooked. I remember her reading Tiki Tiki Tembo and I love giving that book for baby showers. I popped into the children's department a few years back and told them how I remembered Mrs. Twitchell and they still had the same tapestry of the frog prints on the wall. She basically changed my life by introducing me to a love for reading that has lasted a lifetime. Libraries are a constant through life. And this is um, from Catherine Kay. Libraries have been an important part of my life. When I was in fourth grade, I discovered my love for reading and the librarian helped me find books to read and we discussed what I thought of them. When I was in middle school, we lived in England in a tiny little town. There weren't any kids my age. So my mom took me to the library once a week and I got a stack of books to last me until the next week's visit. In high school, my mother worked at the town library. So every day after school, I would walk there, do my homework, read and volunteer. When my kids were little and we had no money, my friend and I went to the library every uh, Sunday to check out books for the week. It was my weekly no kids. I had three kids in four years time. We would spend a couple of hours there and had a coffee. Since we are a military family, we are limited on the amount of weight we are allowed to uh, have when we move. I have a nice book collection, but when you read a book a day, you have to find a solution. Hello eBooks. The military has an enormous digital library, so I borrow books from them and the local library when I can. Libraries are amazing. All right, American author Madeline Engel, um, you know, the author of A Wrinkle in Time, uh, which is a classic. She has won multiple Newbery Medal Awards and others. But later in life, she served as a librarian and writer in residence at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. Okay, this is one of my favorite stories. This is um, Hank Ryan Philippi, um, USA to, um, Today bestselling author of over 12 thrillers. Um, she's won, oh gosh, the most prestigious awards in the genre, five Agatha Awards, three Anthony's, the Daphne and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. But this is um, Hank's story and I just love it. So she says, I grew up in really rural Indiana, so rural that you couldn't see another house from our house and I had no friends, but my sister and I would ride our ponies to the library and fill up the saddlebags with books for the ride home. We could each get 10. 
I remember no matter how much we cajoled Mrs. Adams, you can come back however often you like, she'd say, but only 10 at a time. Then we'd read our treasures up in the hayloft in the barn behind our house. There's where I first read Nancy Drew and Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie. And that's where I fell in love with storytelling. Here's another story from a reader. Uh, libraries are a remedy for loneliness. And this is from Vicki from Richmond, Virginia. And she says, I went to the library during recess when I was in elementary school. I was a sickly child, asthma, and not allowed to go outside. The librarian was an older lady who at first just looked at me over the top of her glasses. Then she started to talk to me about what I was reading. Then she started suggesting books to me. And finally, she started talking to me about the content and characters. I considered her my first book club because she let me know that wherever books are, I was accepted. Okay, this is one of my favorite writers of all time. And I was thrilled when she shared this story with me. Um, Elizabeth Berg, the author of many New York Times bestselling author, uh, books and just an amazing storyteller. And she talks about how libraries um, serve you with dignity and grace, no matter who you are. And this is her story. My mother was always grateful for what books and libraries gave her, but never more so than when my dad got Alzheimer's. Each night at the end of a challenging day, she could at least escape a bit by digging into the pile of books she kept at her bedside. One day while I was visiting my parents, I took my dad with me to the library to get some novels for my mom and also to give her a little time alone. I stationed my dad in a comfortable chair where I could keep an eye on him and went to pick out various titles. I asked my dad if he'd like to look at some books while he enjoyed his coffee. And he said, no, which I took to me, yes. So I bought him, brought him a big fat book featuring photos of amazing tree houses. He was quite absorbed in looking at it. Even when I was finished making my selections and said it was time to go, uh, he was still reading. And she asked, would you like me to check that book out for you? And he said, no, thanks. And this time she knew he meant it. He was done with the book because his focus now was getting back home to my mom, who was his beloved with a capital B. Still, what a pleasure it was to look over the railing from the second floor fiction section and see the top of my dad's head bent over a book, taking in all that he could for the whole time we were there. The room was warm and quiet and comfortable and safe, and in the way of libraries everywhere, it conferred upon its visitors a measure of dignity and grace. My mother wasn't the only person gifted by the library that day. I love that story. Here's another one, how libraries soothe grief. And this is from Jeannie from Indiana. And she says, a local librarian took me under her wing when she learned my husband passed away. I had sadly commented that my interest in joy in reading had become non-existent. Inquiring about my interests, her book suggestions began coming by email, phone, and even Zoom meetings. I think I became her personal project. As a result, my reading is back, and I'm so grateful to her for that. Okay, back to me for just a little bit. So, grew up in Mason City, loved the library. Um, then it was time for me to move on, and I went to the University of Iowa, got my degree in elementary education. And wouldn't you know, my first job was back in my old hometown of Mason City. My first classroom was in my classroom, my uh, fourth grade classroom, teaching fourth grade. Um, just a few blocks from that beautiful library. So once a month, I would line my students up at the, the door, hand out their library cards, and we'd walk across that footpath all the way to the library, where a wonderful librarian was there waiting for us. And she'd read stories and then release my students into the stacks to find books that were just right for them. And then they'd check out three books um, and make their way back across the footbridge. 
um, back to school. And I finally realized it took me to um, you know, me becoming an adult and a teacher and realizing that, you know, 20 uh, fourth graders carrying books over an open body of water is kind of a stressful thing. So the limit on books was probably a good thing. And still later, um, after teaching in Mason City for a few years, I, I got married and moved to I moved to Dubuque and got married. And um, that toy box came with me. My parents made um, painted it this beautiful cream color and stenciled roses across it and filled it with linens and towels and all the things that we would need for our married life to begin. And as the kids, um, we had children, the kids played in it and kept their toys in it. And now you can see I updated a little bit. Um, it's now painted black uh, to match um, the furniture in my little office. And my dog kind of has taken over the seating there, but um, I, I store my writing supplies and journals in uh, that toy box now. So it's really come on a journey with me. And, um, you know, when I get together with my brothers and sisters now, um, we don't live too very far from each other. Uh, we will talk about, um, oh, things that happened when growing up. We'll say, do you, somebody will say, do you remember the time that Molly released her parakeet out into the wild two minutes before the, the hailstorm began? Or somebody will say, do you remember when Patrick got in the car accident? Um, the night mom and dad were in Minneapolis for the Neil Diamond concert. Or someone will say, do you remember the night that uh, Greg brought home the tarantula? And I say to these, you know, I really don't remember these. I don't remember it happening. I remember the stories. I don't remember it happening though. And my brother Greg of the tarantula would say, that's because you were always in the toy box. And I was. I'm glad to say I'm out of the toy box, but of course that um, it, it remains a very important part of my life. All right, another famous librarian, Barbara Gordon, librarian by day, Batgirl by night. We know that librarians are superheroes, don't we? So Barbara Gordon was the daughter of the police commissioner and also worked as a librarian. She only began her crime fighting career by accident, breaking up a robbery when she happened to be wearing her Halloween costume. Who was the victim of the crime? Well, Bruce Wayne, of course. So librarians are definitely superheroes. I have one final story for you, and it's a story of hope. And this is my mom's story. And I, I love sharing this. She often says, books are her friends. And here are my mother's words. She says, when I was 10 or 11 years old, I discovered the Carnegie Free Public Library. I walked into the children's area and left my chaotic world behind me and came into a warm, quiet, welcoming room. I felt safe, peaceful, and accepted. A kind librarian told me the rules and handed me a library card. I was ready to begin my lifelong love of books. I chose the allowed five books to check out and I was on my way. Every two weeks I would return and choose five more books. I was so comforted to find a different life than my own. A life with normal loving families who were safe, never hungry, having clothes that fit. And best of all, I found new friends in every book. Books gave me hope that I could find a better life someday. Books were my friends and still think that today. My life gradually did change. I was able to go to boarding school at the age of 15, graduated and became a nurse and married the love of my life. We have six devoted and successful children. I am blessed and so thankful. And that's from my mother, Patricia Schmida, Iowa. So for librarians and for uh, National Library Week, we really um, want to let them know that we thank them. And surely this of course includes you, that you, um, we wanna thank you for being our Ben Franklins, our Casanovas, our Beverly Clearies and our Batgirls. But most of all, thank our librarians for what they bring 
to this very noble profession. Thank you for being a safe haven, telling us that we matter, for being a sanctuary, for being life-changing, a remedy for loneliness, for soothing grief, for greeting all who enter with dignity and grace, providing hope, and for being a calm in the storm. Thank goodness for libraries. Thank you, everybody. I would love to answer any questions that you might have. I will um, stop sharing the screen now so I can see all of you a little better. Uh, does anybody have any questions? You can either unmute yourself to ask your questions or you can put them in chat. And that can be about writing, it can be about reading, what I'm reading these days. Um, it can be anything really. So feel free to jump in. Um, I have a question. Sure. How did you begin writing? Yes. So um, for me, you know, I've always loved to write, um, but it was always kind of a hobby and um, something I did um, in my free time. When I went to school, I went to school to become a teacher. I didn't ever think I would be a writer. Um, but whenever I could take classes um, in writing, creative writing, I did. But it really wasn't until my kids were school aged um, that I seriously felt like I had a story to tell. And so one day, it was at, right after school was let out for the summer back in 2005, I uh, closed up my classroom and bought a journal and I started writing The Way to Silence, um, Longhand, my first book. And um, I didn't write the whole story longhand. I transferred it over to uh, the computer, but by the end of summer, I had finished my first draft. And it was a very poor, ugly first draft, but I, I had finished that first draft and I stuck it in a drawer um, and got ready for the new school year. And then at um, holiday time, Christmas time again, I pulled it out and asked myself, what am I going to do with this? I, you know, I really loved the process of writing. I loved writing the story, but I didn't know what to do with it. And so I reached, or I, I, found a book called The Writer's Market, which has a listing of different um, publishers and literary agents in North America. It's, come, it's updated every year. And I found a literary agency that represented authors that I enjoyed and that I admired. And I sent the first 50 pages and a letter off to them. And um, a couple of weeks later, I got a letter back asking to see the rest of the manuscript. So of course, you know, incredibly thrilled about that. I printed it off and mailed it back to her. And then I didn't hear anything and I didn't hear anything for a while. And I, I kind of figured, you know, well, it was too good to be true. But um, a couple months later, I thought, you know, I'm just gonna follow up. I'm just really curious to see what she thinks. And I got the nerve up to call her and I said, this is Heather as if I'm from Iowa, as if I'm the only Heather in the state of Iowa. And, um, but she figured out who I was and um, thought that she could work with me. And so this was with the literary agents, agency. It wasn't with a publisher at this point. And um, she worked with me for the next um, year and a half to get the book in better shape, um, to get ready to send to publishers. And so- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How did you find her? That's what I found in the book, The Writer's Market. Okay, and so it has a literary agents in it as well. That's okay. yes, yes. Okay. And um, so she worked with me. We went worked back and forth. Um, and this was before I was, you know, I wasn't making her a penny because they, you know, they read on their own time when they're trying to find new authors. And uh, she took about a year and a half to get it in good shape. I had a stack of rough drafts about yay high. And um, she finally said it's ready to send off to publishers. And then it took another year and a half to find a publisher beyond that. So lots of um, rejection letters in between there. And I just kept writing in between. 
working on the next project. You're a beautiful writer. I'm glad you persisted. <laughs> oh, thank you. And that's one, you know, a thing with writing it and it, uh, you have to be persistent and you have to be patient and you have to love writing and, um, everything moves a little slower in the writing world and, and that's okay. That's just kind of the process of it all. <laughs> thank you. But, any other questions? Yes, I'm just curious, what kind of books do you like to read, Heather? I know that you have a lot of like mystery ones that you write. So I'm just kind of curious what you like to read in your free time. Well, I, I do. I love reading thrillers and mysteries. I absolutely love those as well. So, um, you know, I love Mary Kubica, Lisa Unger, J.T. Ellison, um, Tess Gerritsen, um, Lisa Scottolini, I love all those. Um, but I also love um, historical fiction. Um, Ariel Lehon wrote um, Codename Helene, which is a great historical fiction novel I've um, read recently. Um, the Invisible Woman by Erica Roebuck is an, also another World War II era book that I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, but recently I've been, um, you know, I reached out to my, you know, on Facebook um, to reading friends and said, I, I need something lighter, something um, a little lighter reading for a while. And um, they gave me great, great tips, but I kind of got on this Kristen Higgins kick. If you've never read Kristen Higgins, she's just a fun, funny, light writer, but there's some emotion in it as well. I, I um, but I, I've been reading a bunch of those as well lately. Um, I love listening to audiobooks too. I, I go on hikes a lot and walks a lot. Um, one that I finished recently was uh, Miracle Creek by Angie Kim. Absolutely amazing book. Amazing. That's all I can say. And um, I, I just don't know how she did it, but it was really, really a great book. And I also just finished listening to... Um, the Snowman, which is a thriller by uh, Norwegian white writer Joe Nesbo, which was incredibly creepy, but it was um, it was a good read as well. So I'll read anything you put in front of me. Um, I love Louise Erdrich. I love Ann Patchett, um, Anita Shreve, Elizabeth Berg. So yes, yeah, so many books, <laughs> so little time. Thank you. Any other questions I can answer for you? I can talk a little bit about my newest book, which is coming out next winter, and I'm super excited about it. Um, tried something a little different. So it's called The Overnight Guest. And of course, it's set in Iowa. Um, it's set in a small um, rural community. A writer, a reclusive writer, comes to the community, um, comes to the an old farmhouse, where a crime had taken place 20 some years before to finish up um, a, her true crime book on the case in the small town, small area. And it's uh, middle of winter. She's working on her manuscript and there's a blizzard and she opens up her front door and there is a child um, nearly frozen in her front yard. And so she brings the child into her, into the house, of course, and there's this whole mystery surrounding who this child is and why in the world they're in the middle of nowhere in this snowstorm. And that's interwoven with um, the writer's true crime book that she actually wrote. And so it flashes back 20 years and it talks about the crime that happened in that house. And um, slowly the pieces kind of fit together um, and a complete picture of what's going on up here. So that comes out next January, of course, in the middle of winter. Um, it's called The Overnight Guest. So I'm super excited about that. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, so I have a question. Um, what, do you have any characters that you've written that you like have connected to more than others? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it's so hard when you, you know, you spend so much time with these characters, you get really attached to them, of course. And um, there are a few, though, that really stick with me. And one is um, 
in The Way to Silence, my first book, Callie and her brother, Ben. Um, Callie, and we learn in the book, is um, a girl who doesn't speak. Um, and her brother speaks for her a lot. And um, it's that, st that the story um, about when these two, two young girls go missing and um, this community and the families race to find them. And so I love those two characters. Um, somebody mentioned that they really liked w One Breath Away, which was my, um, my third novel. And there's a teacher character there, Mrs. Oliver, who's my absolute favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite characters. She's like super strict, kind of, um, you know, very particular teacher, but the kids just love her. They adore her. And so she's in that one. Um, I also, Amelia from One Breath Away is also one of my favorite characters. She's a character who I thought about for a really long time. Um, but it took me a long time to write about her. She's a, a profoundly deaf character. And I was really nervous about writing a character who is profoundly deaf because while I, I am hard of hearing, I can hear. Um, but I wanted this character to be, you know, it's all encompassing. And so the story is told with the absence of sound. There's no sound in it. It's told from Amelia's point of view. And she, along with her um, service dog, Stitch, make this it's very scary discovery on the river and have a mystery to solve. And so um, really enjoyed writing that character. So there's so many in every book, there is always a character that you just kind of have a soft spot for. Also follow up question, how is Lolo? <laughs> Lolo is great. And, you know, normally I'd have her here with me. I'm at my mom and dad's house tonight. So Lolo had to stay at home. Um, but if you don't know who Lolo is, Lolo is my sidekick. She's a German short haired pointer who is, um, since my kids had to grow up and move away, you know, grow up. And I, you know, Lolo is my fourth child and usually does everything with me. And in fact, um, if you love pets and you love reading, um, I do have this fun little series that I do called Sidekicks and Side Trips where I interview authors and their pets. And they, the other authors will bring their pets and Lolo's with me and we chat for a few minutes about animals and books. And then the, the companion to that is for the authors that don't have pets, um, side trips, where I talk to authors about some of the passions that they have in life. Like I've had um, an author who loves to bake and author who, um, who, loves to bicycle and so just it's really fun one author an Iowa author Kelly Van Valley White who is a huge advocate of um, for mental health and she talked about that so if you get a chance to um, look that up on social media those are a lot of fun to watch so Lolo is great great center of my world <laughs> any other questions are there podcasts you mentioned when you listen to are there podcasts that you really like for writing or um for writing you know i haven't i'm trying to think if i found one for writing um i'm sure there are i i can tell you there's some audiobooks for writing or books for writing uh -huh. that i own copies of the book and i own um the audio versions of them um bird by bird by ann lamott i have that <laughs> okay, and the audio is read by her, by Anne Lamott. So it's really fun to listen to as well. Um, On Writing by Stephen King, which you okay. think, Stephen King, really? But no, he's really got great writing tips. Um, uh, Escaping Out into the Open by Elizabeth Berg is another great writing book. I have a whole stack of them. Um, <laughs> that I love. But as for a podcast, I don't know that I found one on writing that I have hooked on to yet. I would love okay. to. Just any podcast you like, I would. Oh, any it. podcast. Okay. Yeah. I listen to podcasts all the time. Um, this American Life, of course. Um, the Moth. Okay. It's about story. It's storytelling. It's fabulous. Uh, they tell the, the presenters just tell stories that have happened in their life and pretty amazing. Um, I like the true crime ones too. Like um, there's one called True Crime Obsessed. That's kind of funny, um, which I like that. Oh my gosh, now I'm gonna have to look. There's so many. I am constantly, 
I like Crime Junkie for Crime Junkie. Yes. Yeah. yes. yeah, absolutely. She um Flowers is her last name, yeah, right? Ashley Flowers. Ashley Flowers, and she's got Favorite. this talking voice, speaking voice, and she gets yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's so so good. Oh yeah, there's just so many. I I think I'm gonna have um an earbud permanently fused to my ear um if I'm not careful. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay, what's everybody else reading? If anybody wants to shout out, I'm always looking for books to read. I'm reading this one right now. It's called A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. Ooh. It's by Holly Jackson. Okay, yeah, That's Holly Jackson's great. I haven't read that. I That looks right, right up yeah. my alley. Got it at the Carnegie Stout Public Library too. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's super good. Okay. Check that out. Anybody else? I am currently going through the Percy Jackson series. Mm -hmm. My friend is a middle school teacher, and her and I decided to read some of the books that her kids are reading. And I can get through one in like a couple of days with going to work and everything. It's such a nice, relaxing thing to read. <laughs> And you know that, you know, I love young adult books. They are so um, sophisticated. And I, I guess is a word a way. I mean, they're so well written. And so great. Um, that I don't know, I don't even know why they call them young adult, I guess the topics probably are a little more uh, suitable for for younger people, but they are so won wonderfully written. And they're yeah, don't oh, overpass pass those by because there's some really great ones out there I I love them because it's not not to like boost your ego but like one of the reasons I love your book so much is because there's so much character development mm -hmm. and I love connecting with these characters and I feel like young adult books do Thank that you. so much better than a lot of the books that I read for adults well, thank you. <laughs> a lot thank you <laughs> I'm actually listening to a nonfiction. I, I like the library's Libby offering for oh. podcast or for books on tape. And Same. <laughs> I have such a hard time reading nonfiction. It's just, it's hard for me to physically read it, but I yeah. can listen to it on audio. So I'm listening to Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. And he's talking about micro dosing LSD. <laughs> Is he a food guy? Yes. Okay. Yes. He's, he writes a lot about food. Oh, that sounds interesting. It really is. And it, it I mean, it's pretty far out there, but he's he's not a crazy person. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Great. <laughs> and my daughter is a, a, she introduced me to the um, podcast for True Crime and Crime Junkie. And we did a road trip where we listened to back to back Crime Junkie, <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah, it's so great when you can find a podcast that they, you have all these back episodes that you can just binge and listen to. So, yeah. yeah. Anybody else? I'm reading an Iowa author, um, Diane Murr, and she's um, written about 32 books about this um, imaginary town in Boone County, which I'm from, and um, of how she grew up in Story City, now she's back, she's rehabbing the school, and then she morphs the whole town into her town, and I, her name is Polly, I call them my Polly books, but I tell everyone they're fun, they take place, she gets married, adopts kids, and has this whole imaginary town going on, and there's and she finds a body and there's always a mystery in every Oh, those sound fabulous. Diane Muir, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay, those sound amazing. Yeah, I love, you know, setting is so important in books as well. If you feel like there's that, um, that community that you can build around you as you read. Yeah, I love that. I have to tell you that your first book came out and we read it as our book discussion book in my little hometown library here. And at the time I had, my daughter was young and she was having to go visit her father whom 
I wouldn't leave a dog with, but, <laughs> and your book, it just, it was like, oh my God. It was, it, your book was so well done and it was, and, um, but I have to tell you, it was disturbing for me at that moment in my life. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, and that's the thing that, and I, you know, as a, mom too um when my kids were younger there are certain like the deep end of the ocean by Jacqueline Michelle yep. I couldn't yep, read that, that. One I write these too. you know write these very <laughs> troubling books but I could not read that book as a young mom and then um as my kids yeah. got older I found like some of the thrillers with teens in them it was a little tougher for me to read those so yeah, yeah. you don't want it to hit too close to home <laughs> so. uh, yeah. see I I firmly believe that you actually wrote The Weight of Silence about my family. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and so I actually made my sister read it because I recommend your books to everyone. And my sister was like, I can't finish this. Her name is Callie. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, coincidence. <laughs> so it was, it was just like way too close to home. My mother and my sister were like, please don't. We can't read what you read. But <laughs> they all loved it. <laughs> wow. Thank you for reading. I appreciate that. So Heather, in the comments, there were a couple of, um, Donna said, Rise Bowen is an author she has just started reading. Oh yeah. And Julie Shook said, I just finished Heather Graham's newest one and I love any by Ivanovich. Those are great choices. Yeah, love those. So um, we've been here just about an hour. So any last questions for Heather before we call it a night? Thank you. It was so nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's fun to be here. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, this has been recorded and we will be posting it. We'll probably trim off the discussion at the end and leave it just with Heather. <laughs> uh, and um, it'll be on the library's Facebook channel and YouTube. So if you missed anything or you want to catch some of those recommendations, you can go back and, and listen to Heather again. Thank you all so much for participating. Thank you. Thanks, Shirley. And thank you, libraries. <laughs> Bye. Bye.